uh, Tyler Vega. Uh, he is the founder of Washington Brandicrats Coalition, and how we got to know him um, from the beginning uh, is just just an amazing. Uh, story. So I'm really looking forward to talking with him. Tyler, are you with us today? Right here. Thank you so much for being with us. Of course, always happy to do it. So Courtney and I, we both kind of fought over uh, who was going to do the interview today because we, <laughs> uh, we both have so much history. So Courtney um, allowed me to, to take the lead. <laughs> I'm so gracious. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, a little bit to beginning about yourself, um, about how you um, got in, involved, you know, I guess we want to point out, you know, to the Bernie, you know, because we are the Bernie Kratz uh, um, doing the show. Uh, you've been involved with the Bernie Kratz um, for the last couple of years now. And we have a picture of you out on the road, actually we'll come to in a little bit. Um, uh, about you working for Bernie, but just talk about your your congressional district six real quick. What does it encompass? Uh, what parts are are in there um, that you'll be? Uh, well, the geographic location of CD six is really the entire Olympic Peninsula, um, part of Tacoma, the northeastern part of Tacoma, all the way out to. Um, the northern part of Grace Harbor, uh, all the way up to Nia Bay, and then out to where I'm physically located in Port Townsend. Uh, so the larger, larger cities in the district are Port Angeles, Port Townsend, Tacoma, Paulsbo, Silverdale, um, and all of the west side of the Puget Sound. It's a, a very large district, and most of the district is um, is actually the the park is the Olympic, um, the the, the 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 Olympic nature. National Forest. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to find a better word for it that's a little bit more old school than that. But yeah, it's. Okay. I mean, we are we are kind of the last bastion of true nature in the lower 48, and the reason why most of us live here. The rainforest. Yeah. The rainforests. <clears throat> so uh, we saw the picture already. You outside of the Bernie van. Uh, so you were uh, an integral player. I actually met you um, during the first time at, uh, in face to face anyway, um, uh, at the Washington state convention, uh, you were out outside with, um, a bunch of, uh, candidates, letting them speak. You gave them space to be able to speak, uh, to all of us. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, what all did you do, uh, with the Bernie campaign? Well, that was, um, it was the first major event. Actually, that was the day I both met both of you two. Um, it was the idea at the time uh, was really centered around Bernie at the time. Uh, that's, you know, that's passed away. Now it's really about not be us. It's about us way. I mean, it's all, not at all about Bernie anymore, but at the time it was clear that the super delegate issue was going to rule the day. It was clear that it was that the democratic party was going to nominate whoever they chose and the, and the vehicle they were going to use to do that was the super delegates. So I went around and looked at all of the elected superdelegates that we had in Washington State that were challengeable, and I found one person in every race to gather together as one voice to say, hey, look, if you guys are seriously going to ignore the, the wishes of your constituents, we're going to try to do something about that and replace you. Um, and we, although we weren't successful in that campaign, we did um, gather that group of, of individuals, and I think there were... Um, there are ten. I think there were ten super delegates in Washington State that were, and five of them were seeking re-election that very year, and so that whole campaign was all about that. It was about uh, putting pressure on these people, and as it turns out, that doesn't result in that much pressure because the system is so heavily reg rigged in these people's favor that um, that our voice is really quite quiet. Uh, but all of those people are still being challenged and we're challenged at that time and they know we're here. And um, I've had face to face conversations with some of them in organized, um, organized events where their challengers are interacting in such a way that they're not going to forget easily that the people are up and aware and care and are um, not really okay with the way things are rigged. Um, which of course has led me to this, um, 
So the primary focus of my current campaign, which is all about Article the First, the original First Amendment of the Constitution, which still, despite having been ratified, has yet to be enacted and is, in my opinion, the only solution to most of our problems, at least politically, if not socially and beyond. So we've done an interview with you before regarding Article the First, but for those that uh, missed that, that, that can go back and watch that, of course, can just do a brief summary of that. Absolutely. Uh, again, this is the whole focus of my campaign. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily here. I'm, I'm happy to get elected to this to this position. But what I'm really doing is pushing Article the First. Originally, when this country was founded, there were 12 amendments, and 11 of them have been enacted. The first one, and the most important by far, took a little bit more hashing out than the rest of them, basically because we had things like slavery to deal with, and um, representation was considered the only way we could could make a republic or a, uh, a functional democracy through this concept of representation. And the forefathers, in all of their flaws, knew that if we did not maintain uh, representation, that we would uh, basically degenerate into aristocracy, oligarchy, whatever you want to call it, which we have. Uh, and so the article, the first basically defended the people's right to have representation in the government through the house of representatives, which is our, that is our voice in the government. It's our only voice. You know, we're not represented by the president. We're not represented by the judicial branch. We're not represented really by, by the Senate. Um, the Senate's job was to re represent the states. The president was the ultimate veto power, and the, ju the judicial branch was designed to interpret. The people were supposed to speak to the government through the House of Representatives. And so at the time, there was this huge conversation about how that should be protected throughout the ages, and they eventually came to the conclusion that there needed to be one representative for every 50,000 people. And that was sent out and ratified by the right number of people, but never, uh, the word is promulgated. It was never enacted. And to this day, it has not been enacted. And um, so there's a lawsuit right now in court in, uh, in DC that will go all the way to the Supreme Court that, uh, that readdresses this yet again, not for the first time, uh, but, uh, but likely for the last time, because... Uh, because the evidence is quite clear in this in this age in the third millennium we have the ability to see the evidence clearly quickly and concisely and it's pretty pretty obvious it's not not only it was not only ratified once but i believe three different times uh it it has officially um passed the test to become an amendment in the constitution so when we talk about the first amendment we're not talking about freedom of speech and press <clears throat> we're talking about the original first amendment back in the day which had to do every everything had to do with representation and it is the entire conversation that our 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 way of governing is based on and it's been lost it's it's been um uh, checked we have 435 representatives for <clears throat> all 300 million of us right now and it's just not functioning Wow, it would be nice to actually start feeling like we were getting represented. So if we were doing every 50,000 um, people here in Washington State, uh, about how many more representatives would we end up getting out of it? Well, that, that's actually an interesting, that's the, one of the reasons why this has come to the forefront as the, the, the solution to our problems, the silver bullet, if you will. It, because it would increase the size of the House of Representatives by a factor of eight or so, which would basically mean that we're all getting elected, you know, me and Sarah Smith and Tambourine Borelli and Dorothy Gasquet, these amazing candidates, Robert, are all getting elected. And suddenly the people would have a supermajority in the House of Representatives. It's just kind of the way it's designed. And the, you know, having a supermajority is no small thing. It basically means that you can do what you want, because that's the way our country is supposed to work. If the people agree on something, you're supposed to be able to do it. The vast majority of people, for example, agree on single payer health care, on universal health care. So we would just be able to do that, period, done. Also, we have a uh, insane monkey as a president who is supposed to be checked by the House of Representatives and is not, and he's rampant as a result of not having any checks. We're designed on a system of checks and balances that doesn't have any checks and therefore has no balance. That's the House of Representatives' job. So when we increase this to you know, eight times its, its natural, uh, its current state to the proper state, we have the ability to eliminate uh, serious problems like the president. And, uh, and if we have to, then we just keep on moving down the chain and Mike Pence would, become a, would be after that and 
uh, Paul Ryan would be this as the speaker would be after that. And it's, it's not that simple. I can't, I'm oversimplifying it because of <clears throat> just for sake of time. Right. But the, the truth is that that's the only body that does that job. How it does it is not so much relevant and it is relevant that it is not doing it and it can do it after we win this lawsuit. Right. And you, you, you call yourself like a single candidate, uh, a single issue candidate. Um, but I always try to disagree with you because you're not out there just talking about this. You're, you're also talking about universal health care, you know, single payer, uh, sustainability, responsible use of military force. You've got <laughs> you're more than one issue. <laughs> yeah. And, I, I, you know, when I say that, I'm joking because I, know. I, because I want to draw the focus to that issue because it is the issue that can really solve all our problems. Universal health care is required. It's what the people are behind, and it's what we need to keep our our people whole and healthy, so that we can. It's the it's required maintenance. Uh, article the first is let's solve some problems here. So I'm I'm really not a, a one issue candidate at all. You know I have this 78 foot schooner that I want to sail around and clean up the ocean and 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 put people like you guys on to, to get progressive candidates elected and, and, and every issue that is on the progressive platform, you know, on the, the platform you yourself are spearheading, you know, is, is all very dear to my heart. So I, and I, I apologize for jesting too seriously about that. I am uh, all about all of those things. Yes. Uh, you did bring up your, your ship. So can you talk about the Nina Oto? Koti, the flagship. But so you've not only been very aware politically, but you have been an activist all your life. You know, you've done some amazing things. But one of the main things that you is near and dear to your heart is cleaning up the ocean. Can you speak on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it uh, it's not on the front burner. It can't be because we have too many more serious problems. But you know, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, we have one of the five. Uh, gyres of the world, which is an estimated 70 trillion tons of human waste floating around in the middle of the ocean. And it all coalesces in this one giant soup of nastiness that basically nobody knows how to tackle and deal with. And when I learned about this years ago, I was like, oh man, I mean, this is going to take lifetimes. We better get started. And so I started, uh, I was already studying, uh, you know, the nautical science, but I uh, started getting real serious about that. I, you know, I bought a little boat, learned how to sail it, and um, started tackling all these systems. Now I've just um, finished my fourth round of of being an assistant in uh, in the the captain's class, the where you know the captain who teaches captains to be captains, and um, have also applied for my own captain's license. Mm-hmm. All with the uh, long term goal of beginning the process of solving this. And uh, there's a man in in on the east coast who's dealing with the Atlantic gyre. Uh, Boyan Slat is his name, who's very successful. He's raised a huge pile of money and has a, a, a way he'll go about doing that. And it's, it's moving forward. It's really beautiful to watch. Uh, nobody as of now is doing anything but research on the North Pacific Gyre, which is the largest. And so my long-term goal before I die is to begin the process of cleaning that up. And the Nino Otaki was this, uh, it's a dream boat. It has, you know, it contains all of these ideas and uh, desires of making the world a better place. And one of the long-term goals is to be a part of this cleanup mission. On the way, the idea is that you can see, if you can imagine that ship pulled up to a dock, it's a, it's a stage with uh, these giant uh, banner poles. So you can put uh, the face of your candidate up between the masts on the sails and put a couple of Mackies up next to a band and a speaker and basically have a mobile party to draw attention to the issues and to the people that are going to fight for the issues. And so that's the intention. If we can find the crew and the, and the funds to, to move that, you know, to keep that running, uh, which is no small task. It's uh, actually a very, very challenging task. Uh, we'll do that. And so this, uh, this conversation is also, Part of this conversation is a call out to look for that crew, people who are dedicated to the movement, who um, are comfortable with the rustic lifestyle that is living uh, on the water. It, it is challenging and must be taken seriously. And and the willingness to, to take the issues that we all care about and move them forward in a powerful way. It's a vessel, literal, a literal and figurative metaphorical vessel to, to do that work. I can't wait. I know that we're hoping that we'll be able to get it into Tacoma um, the weekend of May 6th uh, for the big rally. Um, 
I, I can't believe being able to just to pull up and have the stage right on the water, uh, how amazing that would be for all of our candidates and all of the issues. Yeah, well, anything that you do that uh, that kind of makes it interesting is useful. Poli- you know, people don't really want to deal with politics. People who care do, but, pe- you know, the, the lay person, it's too much time and too much energy. But if you can turn it into a party and have it be interesting and, you know, I mean, pirates are in. This is a pirate ship and, and it's and it's time to make use of it as such. Uh, May 6th, incidentally, is the is the last day of filing week. Uh, so that is a very, very significant time in the lives of candidates. And I'd like to get the ship down there sooner. Um, you know, I myself need 1,700 signatures to uh, in order to file for office, and I need them before that. So it would be nice to be doing events before then. I, uh, I do want to interject just a I'm moment. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, but I believe May 18th is the end of filing week. But it's still very close proximity-wise, and we do need to get signatures in before then. Yeah, well, we should check that. Um, okay. My understanding, yeah, well, well, we can check that. But the, okay. the, the signatures obviously have to be gathered long before oh. um, as 1,700 have to be acquired. Okay. Um, Good and, point. It might be signatures need to be turned in before. Uh, the signatures get turned in during filing week, whichever week it is. Okay. And, okay. <clears throat> in any Sorry. case, that, that would be really cool if, it was, if that event happened to be before filing would be really cool because it might give us just enough to get over the hump on that one. And, and all of our candidates really should be using signatures, not dollars, because, uh, you know, who, I mean, a pay to play system is not really fair. It's prohibitive. I mean, I, you know, I don't make a lot and I don't have a lot and, uh, but I'm stable. And, you know, the thought of coming up with $1,700 to run for office is daunting. Uh, it, it's, probably prohibited for me, you know, me myself and it really should be done by signatures. So the same conversation, you know, we need people who are willing to go out of their way to gather signatures alongside I-1600 for me and for Robert and for uh, Dorothy is already doing it, but certainly Sarah and Tambourine and, you know, keep the money in these campaigns and ideally keep the money in the pockets of the people because uh, our system is stuck and broken such that we are all uh, being crushed by it and, last thing we need to be doing is throwing money into plastic yard signs. I understand that that has to be done for the, the good of the, the whole, but you know, ideally not. And so every time, every time we have a chance to, to circumvent that, then we should do so. So each signature represents like $1 towards Literally. your filing fee. Yeah. One to one. So, and you can find those um, signature forms on the secretary. Uh, uh, you just go to my, my webpage, tylervega.com. They'll be, you know, you'll be one click away. It's a lot easier than surfing through their web. Their, their page. You know, Kim Wyman doesn't really want you to know that that data is there. It's, it's a lot of work for her, and, and you know, she's invested in the system staying the way it is. Uh, but it is there. You can find it if you Google um, filing fee petition, I think, within the SOS website. But easier to go to tylervega.com. Wonderful. Oh, go ahead. So um, I looked up the filing week dates and the key dates are May 1st is the first filing uh, officer, the first day the filing officer may receive candidate declarations by mail. The 15th is the official candidate filing week open and May 19th is the final day for all candidates to file for office. Great. Thank you. That changes the the significance of that uh, early May uh, gathering incredibly and I'm very glad to know that that actually um, that has a massive impact on my plans actually. Excellent. Uh, I think Brian uh, do you have a question uh, from the audience? There was one question I have to from uh, Den Gok. Uh, how are your views around the subject of worker co-ops and unions? Uh, yeah I'm, I'm very much in in favor uh that's that to me is is a is this it's a fractal of of democracy really it's what's it, it's it's the same conversation as the house of representatives conversation the people and mass uh use this distillation process by which they check the powers of greed uh the, you know the, the the you know capitalism is the harnessing of of greed basically in in a nutshell and the only thing that's going to check it is people's uh a goodwill and b their um need to survive and thrive and the you know worker co-ops and worker unions are 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 the embodiment of the solution to that problem and so if we're going to maintain you know if we're going to keep free enterprise uh, you know quote unquote 
and and continuing in this capitalist system, which I'm not necessarily uh, for or against. I'm just accepting it as it is. The only way we're going to not have the people be further enslaved or further pushed into serfdom are these structures, the the unions and the worker owned co-ops. So I'm, I'm a hundred percent in favor of those things and consider them the, uh, the last bastion of true democracy in our world, actually. Wow. Nice. Uh, any others, uh, Brian, while we're looking at the questions? No, nope, nothing much. Oh, wait, got one question. Is capitalism uh, and morality mutually exclusive from Jilly? Mm-hmm. No, it's apples and oranges. Uh, capitalism is just is is it's just nature. It's it's the it's the it's the self serving nature of people and organisms. And, you know, I think of a corporation as just an organism. It's just not a very smart organism. It's self serving. It's eating and it's pooping and it's it's doing its thing, and it doesn't know how to check itself. It's kind of like a like, well, if you imagine like a, a dog that is with unlimited food or whatever, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't naturally just check itself. It doesn't have that morality. A corporation does not have morality. And so they're not mutually exclusive. They're just different things. The morality of the corporation in, from the, in a metaphorical standpoint, in my, in my estimation is really the, the union. It's the, it's the workers of that corporation uh, unionizing and becoming the voice of reason for that entity is the only way that thing can have morality. So to say it's mutually exclusive is, is I I think it needs to be mutually inclusive, to be honest. I think that greed is going to be there. You know, I, we humans naturally have both greed and morality in us. We're very dualistic creatures as does the corporation, but we have to insert that into the corporation. We can't just let it run or judge it or try and kill it. It's not going to work. The only thing that's going to really solve that, I mean, governance will help that once we get there, once we fix our House of Representatives and get money out of politics and all these other things, we can start to check those things from the top. But in the time being, uh, you know, the union is the only thing we got. And that is the morality. Right. Thank you um, for actually going into that question. That was great. Uh, We're going to be wrapping up. So what I'd like you to do is, again, let everybody know what they can do to help, where they can find you. Um, yeah, happy to do that. Uh, my website, website is tylervega.com. Uh, and there should be easy contact info. Uh, Facebook is, uh, facebook.com slash Vega in the house. Uh, and I'm, I'm reachable. You can find me. I mean, my, my cell phone number is published in multiple places and I, you know, I need crew for my ship or the the people need crew for their ship. Uh, We need people gathering signatures for I-1600. We really need that. And while you're doing that, you can support whatever candidate is running in your district by gathering signatures for them as as well. Um, In a perfect world, we would have, you know, a small campaign team, kind of like, kind of like you guys are, uh, but dedicated to every one of these progressive candidates. Um, And I'll mention them, uh, out of love and respect in CD9, Sarah Smith, in CD10, Tambourine Borelli, in CD3, Dorothy Gasquet, and in CD8, Robert Hunsiger. Um, you know, we have the people are standing up and they need the people to succeed. We're, you know, these are all David and Goliath level campaigns and every, every ounce of help is more than needed. And so reach out to me or us uh, WashingtonBurnieCrats.org has a link to volunteer sites. Look all over the internet and get on one of these teams. And if you want to be on a really interesting and awesome intrepid team aboard a 80 foot schooner, um, then definitely call me. And if you want to help me gather signatures for my own campaign and you're in CD6, I could really use your help. And so could all of these other people. So uh, TylerVega.com is the easiest way to kind of look in the, the, um, to look for contact info that it should be pretty easy to get to me from there. 